The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Vice Chair Ornshaw. Here. Senator Goykichia. Here. Senator Daly. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Chair Flores. Present. Please let the record reflect all members are present and we have a quorum. Good afternoon, everyone, to the very hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. Uh, we have four bills up for presentation today. At the request of our majority leader, we're going to take the agenda out of order. Uh, it's uh, Assembly Bill 189, followed by Assembly Bill 213, followed by Assembly Bill 172, and then lastly, uh, Assembly Bill 219. And then we'll do work, uh, excuse me, uh, public comment at the very end. I want to remind everybody to please silence your cell phone. I am doing that now myself. Um, we're going to limit testimony and support opposition in neutral to two minutes. Obviously, that does not apply to our presenters. Uh, in addition to that, uh, should you have testimony that exceeds two minutes, I, I ask that you please provide your written comments to our committee secretary so that she may upload those to uh, Nellis. Along with that, please state your name for the record after each time that you're asked a question. Uh, feel free to go direct to each member. You do not have to go through the chair. And uh, the only additional comment I wanted to put on the record is uh, for those of you who are, I, I know there's a, a group of you who at some point may have to leave and we're trying to work on time restraints. Um, so if you do have to leave, what we can do is try to acknowledge the amount of folk that are involved in the bill um, and at some point maybe just to put it on the record that X amount of individuals came in in support of this bill so that you don't feel that your travel here was in vain. Your presence obviously means a lot. Um, with that, we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 189, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair, and I will be quick in my remarks since I know there's people who are, sh are tight on time. But Good afternoon, Chair and Vice Chair and all members of the Government Affairs Committee. It's so nice to be back in front of Senate Government Affairs to present Assembly Bill 189 for your consideration. I would say your assembly counterpart would <laughs> say they are the hardest working government affairs committee in the building. <laughs> in 2019, I worked on Assembly Bill 290. My mission was to create a safer work environment on construction sites. We were successful in passing Assembly Bill 290 of the 80th session, which created the OSHA registry to help combat the growing problem of fraudulent OSHA cards. Then in 2021, I worked on Assembly Bill 249 that prohibited common interest communities from restricting the hours that construction work may begin if they were later than those adopted by a governing body of a county or city, but only during the summer months. Creating a safe environment for Nevadans who work outdoors is a priority for me. I am here before this committee, again, tackling a growing problem on, the cons on construction sites. Because Nevada has two of the fastest warming cities in America, our outdoor workers face an invisible threat, the threat of heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Those in the construction industry are uniquely susceptible to heat-related injuries. The work comes with inherent risks, which are amplified by exposure to direct sunlight during the hottest months of the year. From the CDC website, quote, construction workers are at risk of death, injuries, illness, and reduced productivity resulting from heat exposure on the job. Between 1992 and 2016, 285 construction workers died from heat-related causes. More than a third of all U.S. occupational deaths from heat exposure, and it resulted in more than a third of all U.S. occupational deaths from heat exposure. It is possible that heat-related deaths were undercounted due to misclassification. Heat-related deaths have had an upward trend that corresponds with an increase in average summer temperatures during the same time period. Approximately 75% of these fatalities occurred during the summer months, June, July, and August, end quote. Non-fatal heat injuries are far more prevalent. A study conducted in North Carolina showed heat-related injuries as the most common cause for an occupational emergency room visit. Injuries from heat exhaustion or heat stroke can result in cognitive impairment, dizziness, sweaty and slippery hands, slowed response time, muscle fatigue, and cramping, nausea, or vomiting, and clouded eyewear that blocks vision. The risks are obvious when these individuals are working with hammers, power saws, nail guns, and welding and pro propane torches, and doing so suspended several stories in the air or on the roof of a home. 
While everyone is affected, cement masons are most at risk. They are 10 times more likely to die than the average construction worker, followed by roofers, who are seven times more likely to die than the average construction worker. According to the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, one of the most effective ways to combat this is to schedule higher risk jobs for cooler parts of the day. And that is exactly what Assembly Bill 189 aims to do. With your permission, Chair, I would now like to walk the members, um, th actually before we uh, walk the members through the bill, I would like to turn it over to Kelly Gaines, who's joining us in Las Vegas. We'll go to Las Vegas. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee members. For the record, my name is Kelly Gaines. I'm the president and CEO of the Nevada Subcontractors Association. I'm alongside Assemblywoman Howdy and presenting Assembly Bill 189, which revises provisions governing construction start times. The Nevada Subcontractors Association make up 150 residential contractors, subcontractors, construction vendors, suppliers, and other businesses alike. Collectively representing their businesses and the thousands of workers they employ in Southern Nevada, who some are here today in support. Our number one priority in the construction space is to create and adhere to safety standards to protect employees and still having a positive impact on Nevada's economic development. As early as of March 2021, Nevada OSHA had been developing a regulation to address heat illness. Public hearings, stakeholder meetings, and workshops were held. I'd like to reference the informational statement of adopted regulations as required by NRS 233B.066. I submitted for the record, which provides the explanation of the need for adopted regulation to address heat illness. And I quote, the most common time of the day for these injuries and illnesses is from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m., which is during the hottest part of the day. The top three occupations were service, transportation, and material and moving and construction, end quote. In April of 2022, Federal OSHA announced a launch a national emphasis program or known as the NEP to protect millions of workers from heat illness and injuries. In June of 2022, Nevada adopted the federal NEP in modified form. All this said to point out that it has already been identified by federal and Nevada state OSHA Excessive exposure to high temp can create safety concern. However, federal and state programs did not include any regulation regarding the changing the time frame of working in the hottest part of the day. So current restrictions on construction start times or noise ordinances still expose workers unnecessarily to extreme heat during Southern Nevada's high temperature months and inability to complete full work days as our employers do not force their workers to work in these elements. The passing of this bill will be giving them the ability to work full-time hours with limiting their exposure during high heat indexes, overall reducing the safety risk of people that help build Nevada. Thank you for hearing our concerns today, and I believe at this point we're open for questions. Thank you, Chair. And just really quick, I want to explain to the committee what the bill does. This bill will only apply to declarant controlled communities. And so committee, what that means is basically it will only apply to new home construction communities where the community is still builder owned as defined by declarant controlled and only during the months of April 1st through September 30th. So the second a new build residential community has a homeowner move into it that makes the community HOA controlled versus a declarant control, this bill will no longer apply. This gives construction work and subcontractors the ability to start work early during the extreme hot summer months at a job site where the community is still owned by the builder. This bill does not apply to local governments who do not address construction start times in their local ordinances. Thank you, Chair, and we're open for questions. Perfect, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Members, any questions? Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Majority Leader How you for bringing this legislation. I. I, I like the bill. I just wonder if, um, if there's any consideration to either starting earlier or even maybe not having a restriction so that if uh, the work has to be done during the night in a declarant owned community, it could be done during the night when it's coolest and when probably it's safest for the workers and probably most productive. I just wonder if there was any thought to starting earlier than five or maybe not even having a, a start time so that it could be done at night 
in a declare owned community that's still under construction. Thank you for the question, Senator Orenshaw, Assemblywoman Sandra Howdy, for the record. I think that every session that I've, I've come back, I've, I've chipped away at the problem, and I look forward to continuing to do so. I did want to be um, respectful of the, those homeowners who were still in communities, and so I'd like to start with this to see how it works and absolutely revisit some of that during the next legislative session. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Chair. Members, any additional questions? Seeing none, if we could, we could invite both of you to sit back and we'll invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 189. All right, we'll start in Carson City and then we'll go back to Las Vegas. Please. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We know heat-related injuries are a real thing. Um, my husband actually works in safety at a major corporation in Las Vegas doing heat mitigation, and he also works with OSHA and other uh, Nevada organizations to keep people safe and healthy. And during his work, um, his limit during the day because of the heat and the humidity in the building is approximately 80 degrees, and that's when they start doing heat monitoring and heat stress monitoring. And so um, this is something I've learned a lot about in my household over the years um, because Nick talks to me quite a bit about this, and we think this bill is an, an excellent idea for our workers and for the people who are out in extreme heat doing this work. So please pass this important bill. And thank you for joining us. We'll go to Las Vegas. Support for Assembly Bill 189. Thank you, Chair Flores. Members of the committee, my name is Nat Hodson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Southern Nevada Home Builders Association. I'm here in support today for AB 189 and representing SNHBA. Uh, my members are known as what's called the declarant in here. And I just think it's the right thing to do for worker safety. These are the declarants homeowners, so they're very respectful of it. And I think it's a, a, a great way to start. As the majority leader talked about, just taking one little bite to do something to actually help our workers safe, uh, safety out there. So I urge your support on, on this bill. Thank you. And thank you for support, excuse me, for your support testimony. With that, we'll go to the phone, those in support of Assembly Bill 189. If you would like to testify in support of AB 189, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. BPS will stay on the phone for those wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 189. Do we have anybody on the phone? Opposition. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 189, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. We'll do opposition in Carson City or Las Vegas. I see, I see some folk in Las Vegas, so we'll start there. Hi. We're, we're actually uh, in favor of AB 189. Uh, sorry, we walked up a little late. No, no uh, worries. So my name is... Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Schwartz. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources and Safety for Hershey Companies. Uh, we are a subcontractor in Las Vegas with a little over 600 employees, uh, the majority of whom work outside every day in the elements. Um, I am in support of this bill and our company is, as well as we believe that it is vital uh, to our employee safety. Uh, my primary responsibility in, as, uh, as Vice President of Human Resources is not only to uh, build a, a culture of respect in our workplace, but uh, definitely a culture of safety as well. Um, I look at it, this bill is, again, not only as important to safety, but also into recruitment of our uh, future workforce. I speak to several of the high schools uh, here in Las Vegas quite often and attempt to uh, educate our youth about the many opportunities in, in the construction trades and the topic of safety uh, comes up every time. 
and we discuss with the students not only the technology and the and the policies and the investment that construction is making into making the uh, the workplace safe, but also about the time that they work uh, as well and telling students that, uh, that they're going to be required to work outside in the hottest part of the day. That's a, that's a tough sell. And so I am in support of this bill, not only for the, uh, the safety of our current workforce, but also to influence the, uh, the recruitment of a future workforce as well. So thank you. And thank you. Is the gentleman to your right, is he also in opposition, I mean in support in Las Vegas? Yes, sir. Okay, so we'll finish it off with you and then we'll come back to Carson City. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Flores and committee members. For the record, my name is Jorge Macias. I work for uh, Silver Lake Construction. The owner of the company is uh, Richard Brett Willis, which is a very, very good uh, uh, boss, I can tell the boss, who is worried about his people. I mean, we always try to find a way to protect our people, especially uh, when we do concrete, which is, I mean, pouring concrete on the summertime is a nightmare sometimes, especially when they don't let you start working until 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's really, really bad. That's why we are here to support this, uh, this um, AB 189. Um, basically, we're asking for help. Um, that's about it, man. We basically need help. Thank you. And we thank you for uh, presenting today. And is there anybody else in Las Vegas that we accidentally skipped over in support testimony? Seeing none, we'll come back uh, to opposition here in Carson City. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, members of the committee. For the record, David Cherry, Government Affairs Manager for the City of Henderson. That's spelled D-A-V-I-D-C-H-E-R-R-Y. Uh, the City of Henderson remains in opposition to AB 189 because it limits the ability of local governments in Southern Nevada to determine the appropriate start times for construction activities in communities such as the City of Henderson. We appreciate the bill sponsor for allowing us to share our concerns about AB 189 prior to today's bill hearing, and we share the goal of the bill's proponents when it comes to protecting construction workers in Southern Nevada who provide a tremendous service to the skills they provide and the residential housing and commercial products they produce. At the same time, we have a responsibility to all residents of our community to find a proper balance between preserving quality of life and facilitating commercial activity. For informational purposes, our current ordinance allows most construction activities to take place between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. While the amendment captured in the first reprint narrows the scope to declarant controlled common interest communities, we find that these are often located next door to existing neighborhoods where residents may have concerns about construction work being allowed to begin at 5 a.m. seven days per week during the months specified in the bill. In addition, we believe the bill would preempt our ability to restrict times for very disruptive activities such as blasting, which in the city of Henderson is subject to an ordinance that limits when it can occur separate from other construction activities. The city already has in place an exemption process that would allow work to begin outside the established time periods. In the city's view, we believe that this process whereby a building official makes determinations regarding exemptions on an individual basis works well and allows staff to take into account specific circumstances to make an informed decision based on variables such as weather, proximity to existing residential development and other impacts. During the first House hearing on AB 189, the Chair of Assembly Government Affairs requested information on how often the City of Henderson grants exemptions for construction activities to begin before 6 a.m., which is the permitted start time under our municipal co code. Excuse me. For the time period covering January 2022 to March 2023, the city granted three requested exemptions and denied one requested exemption. So there is an existing pathway that is shown to be successful for the majority of those seeking an exemption that will allow for an earlier start time on the types of construction activities in the city of Henderson being discussed here today. I would urge the members of the committee to leave decisions about construction start times in the hands of local government in Southern Nevada and not to adopt a one size fits all approach on this issue. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee for the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas um, for time and because I'm bouncing in between two committees, I will just say ditto. Um, we believe that the uh, preemption language is our biggest concern. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Is there anybody else wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 189? Seeing none, we'll move to the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? 
If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 189, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon. Sir, I'm going to cut you off only because we have a really bad connection. Is it possible for either you to get closer closer to your phone and or if you could hang up and yeah, call right back? Yes, you hear me right now? Yes, we now? can. Now we can. Thank you. you. hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay, sorry. Yeah, did you get my name? No, if we could start from the beginning, please, and we'll reset your clock. C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Uh, I was going to testify in support, but now that I heard opposition, I'm pretty unsure about this. Uh, I do believe that worker safety is very important, and I hopefully something gets done. Uh, hopefully we can kind of uh, look at the opposition comments, make some few changes. I do believe urban heat island effect is very important. I'm glad to see that some bills are being done to mitigate the effects. And I think for one thing you can do to mitigate the effects is to remove parking mandates. Because if we're mandated a certain number of spaces and there's a lot of empty parking lots, that has an impact on temperature. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much. Yield my time. And thank you for joining us. BPS, next caller in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 189. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. We'll close out the neutral position. And before we go back to our presenters, I, I know we had a couple of questions for our local jurisdictions. If I could have the city of Henderson come back. And Senator Krasner, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, for your testimony. So I, I see that the bill's been amended, and so it's only during the hot summer months, and it gets up to about 115 in Las Vegas during the hot summer months. And, you know, obviously the building and construction industry is very important to Nevada, but I'm just, you know, I, I don't want to see anybody die because they're working in this hot 115 degree weather in the middle of the summer. So what what do you propose? What does the city of Henderson propose? Uh, for the record, David Cherry with the city of Henderson. Um, thank you for that question, Senator. I, I apologize if it wasn't clear in my testimony, but we, we have an exemption process. So if a, a construction company uh, comes to us and says, look, uh, we're concerned about the uh, the effects of heat on our workforce, and uh, and again, I will I will say that we clearly value you know what it is that our our uh, construction industry provides in Southern Nevada in terms of the products they they build for us and the importance of having housing, commercial properties. So we recognize that. I think the difference of opinion here between us and the the bill's proponents and the bill sponsor is that we believe local government already has the authority to do this. Um, if somebody wants an exemption, they want to start at 5 a.m., they come to the city of Henderson, they can fill out a form. Our local building official can evaluate why, why they're making this request. And as I stated on the record, we had four requests come to us. Um, we granted three of them. We decided that one, there was not a, a need for that request. I, I believe that the three that we did grant were all because of the heat. Um, so we feel like, um, you know, if instead of having a one-size-fits-all approach where each of the local jurisdictions is uh, denied the ability to have their say with their local building official being able to evaluate the specifics in, in the community where this project is taking place, um, the bill would just basically tell us all, okay, we take away that authority, you have to allow them to begin at 5 a.m. So our start time is 6 a.m., it's only an hour's difference, but we know in the heat of the summer an hour can make a big difference, but we don't feel like we're being unreasonable in saying, we give you the exemption, you just need to come to the city and make the case as to why it is that we are deviating from what our existing start times are. With the idea that we're trying to balance quality of life of our residents with the need to do commercial activity. So, and then the other thing is, as I mentioned in my testimony, you know, we have a specific ordinance, for instance, on really disruptive activities like blasting. I think most people would say you don't want people blasting in your neighborhood at 5 a.m. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm not in the construction industry, so I can't tell you how often blasting would take place in, a, in a, something like a 
a new home construction site. But I mean, we feel as though this preemption would take away our ability to have that separate ordinance on those type of activities. In addition to the ordinance we have, that's just kind of a blanket ordinance that says you can do construction between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. without an exemption. So we could grant the exemption to do it any time between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. We could say if you want to start at 1 in the morning, we could grant that exemption. But again, we'd like to have that authority as the local government. We have that authority now. This bill would take away that authority during the months of April till September. And so just a quick follow-up, Chair. And so even though uh, it calls out that it's only during the summer months, um, you, you still have concerns? Again, David Cherry, for the record. Um, I mean, the concern, again, really is the preemption concern. I mean, we have a process where if someone wants to start at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., 3 a.m., as long as they come forward and make the case that there's a reason and a need for that, and then our building officials can determine, you know, how disruptive is this going to be, who's living in the proximity. I mean, the thing about the sponsor having amended the bill, we do know it's going to be a narrower set of circumstances here. You're talking about a lot of times new construction, maybe we're the construction take place in an area where there isn't a lot of residents, so it's probably not going to be as disruptive. On the other hand, it may be an infill project, a smaller number of houses, but there, everybody around there is already an existing homeowner who I think bought their home not expecting for months on end potentially to have construction activity taking place as early as 5 a.m. So again, it's a balance, and I think we can strike that balance by just basically allowing um, our local government exemption process to remain in place. Um, for the months under the bill, just like, I mean, it's a year-round exemption that's available now, but we know it's most often probably going to be used during the hot weather months if it's, if the weather is the concern. There may be other reasons. I think one of the requests that we had was a matter of uh, time. They felt like they needed uh, to, to work on an, under an expedited time schedule, and so they were requesting an earlier start time so they could get more construction activity in under the allowed time period. So again, it's just a matter of allowing our building official to make the decision as opposed to saying statutorily, one size fits all. There's only one way that this is going to happen. You have to allow them to start at 5 a.m. So I hope that answers your question. And thank you for that. With that, we'll go ahead and do any closing remarks, please. Thank you, Chair. And I, I just want to come back. And we heard from, from the city of Henderson, who does have a process. But we didn't hear that the other local governments have a process. And so I commend them for approving some projects to start earlier. But we need to make sure that every worker in Southern Nevada, whether they're in the city of Henderson or the city of North Las Vegas, has that same safety, has that same ability to start earlier because it's 115 degrees at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 11 a.m. Um, we shouldn't be adding more red tape when it comes to worker safety. To have to go through a process to get something that should be automatic, they should be able to show up to an environment that's safe for them to work at. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that they're willing to evaluate. So if this bill does move forward and it's 5 a.m., again, we know that the two fastest warming cities in America are in Nevada. It's Reno and it's Las Vegas. And if we continue to warm up at this pace, I'm happy to hear that the city of Henderson would be willing to consider 3 or 4 a.m. start time. So thank you so much, committee, for hearing Assembly Bill 189. Senator Daly, please. Before you, I just I just wanted to be clear. Maybe I should ask Mr. Cherry, but your bill doesn't take away their process. They can still give exemptions earlier than 5 a.m., same as they always have, for the same reasons, or deny them, whichever it might be. So it doesn't take away their process at all. It just moves their flexibility back one hour. Correct. Thank you so much, Senator Daly, Assemblywoman Senator Howdy, for the record. And that was the point I was trying to make that, yes, I, I'm happy to see that they'd still be willing to consider earlier start times than 5 a.m. if we do continue to get hotter. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for the presentation. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 189. And next, we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 213. Welcome back. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. I am still Assemblywoman Sandra Howdigy, representing Assembly District 41, and I'm joined today with Christine Hess, representing the Nevada Housing Coalition, who's joining us in Las Vegas, and with Josh Hicks, representing McDonald Carano. I'm here today because over the last 18 months, I've been working on two housing bills. Over those 18 months, I worked with stakeholders from er every area of housing. People who are normally opposed have come together to support the same bills today. Coming to a consensus is incredibly difficult, but we have done the tough work, we have listened to everyone, and come up with bills that I feel are the products of honest, open communication and compromise. We are all giving a little and getting a little. 
The bill I am here to present today is Assembly Bill 213, which I call the Housing Modernization Act. Earlier today, I had the honor of presenting Assembly Bill 298 in Senate Commerce and Labor, which created the Pilot Rent Stabilization Program for seniors. The Housing Modernization Act, which you have before you, I believe is one of the most important bills as it relates to housing supply in this session. Assembly Bill 213 means more affordable housing units, more market rate units, more entry level housing for home ownership opportunities, and more single family residential housing so that every Nevadan has the opportunity to have a place they call home. Chair and committee members, building more affordable housing units is not enough. It's true, we need more affordable housing units, but we just can't keep families there. The goal should be to take families in affordable housing units, transition them into market rate units, then transition them into entry level home ownership units so they can start building equity and building wealth and so on and so on. According to the Habitat for Humanities evidence brief, Quote, low income households and households of color have limited access to home ownership because of barriers such as one, a limited supply of affordable housing, restricted access to credit, and systematic inequities. For those low income households and households of color, home ownership can be a catalyst to wealth building. Home equity accounts for over half of their net wealth. End quote. Chair, I have always said, if we are not helping our families build generational wealth through home ownership, then we are contributing to building a p pattern of generational poverty, and I'm committed to ending that cycle. In 1965, President Johnson said, quote, many elements matter to the success and the stability of our great American society. Education matters a great deal, health matters, jobs matter, equality, equality of opportunity and individual dignity matter very much, but legislation and labors in all of these fields can never succeed unless and until every family has the shelter and the security, the integrity and the independence, and the dignity and the decency of a proper home. We must make sure that every family in America lives in a home of dignity and a neighborhood of pride, a community of opportunity, and a city of promise and hope." End quote. That, this is what I hope for every Nevadan as well, that they live in a home of dignity and a neighborhood of pride, a community of opportunity, and a city of promise and hope. Assembly Bill 213 will help increase inventory, and by speeding up the application to permit process, it will directly impact the costs associated with delays. Chair, with your permission, I would now like to turn it over to Christine Hess with the Housing Coalition, then Josh Hicks to walk the committee through the bill and the amendment. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, members of the committee. My name is Christine Hess, and I'm the Executive Director of the Nevada Housing Coalition. The Nevada Housing Coalition is a statewide nonprofit um, to advance and promote affordable housing for all Nevadans. Thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you, Southern Nevada Home Builders, for your work on this bill and this important legislation of the Housing Modernization Act. Nevada has 485,850 renter households. Just over half, 52.3%, or more than 250,000 of those Nevada renter households are paying more than a third of their household income on their rent. This would be considered unaffordable. This means their ability to access the food they need, medical care, and education are compromised, and certainly their ability to save for a home that wealth building opportunity is also compromised. Affordable housing is complex, but one of the low hanging fruit that's before you today is in section 12 of AB 213, which requires our large jurisdictions to prioritize and incentivize affordable housing projects. This will move affordable housing projects to the front of the line and encourages incentives at the local level to get these product projects across the finish line and meet the community needs. I want to just point out one program that I heard really made a difference, and that was the Clark County Red Flag Team. I won't go into details, but it was initially stood up to support projects moving through the process with the county and BLM. It acted as almost a concierge type service where a project had an internal team with one-on-one -on -one interface and before the fact knowledge to reduce the amount of time to review and complete the project. The language in AB 213 recognizes, of course, that all of our jurisdictions have their own processes and allows them to prioritize affordable housing as it makes sense for them. This is a win-win. 
As many of you already know by now, I am a big proponent of data to inform and help my decision makers, that's all of you, as you consider various barriers and solutions. One solution, of course, is subsidized housing. Our current number of subsidized housing units, including those with rent restrictions or project-based rental assistance, is 37,000. This inventory is tracked and managed by the Nevada Housing Division, and I know this number, where our units are located geographically, and even what income levels are being served because of the consistent annual reporting of our local governments and the highly skilled economist of the Nevada Housing Division who compiles the annual housing progress report per statute and distributes it annually. Knowing this data has been critical for the coalition and its members to identify barriers and opportunities to address the needs of Nevadans who need housing that just doesn't pencil for the market. But we can't build our way out of a, the affordable housing crisis with subsidized un units only. Yes, increasing supply will help, but we need to be building the housing that our communities need, housing for all Nevadans. We must also engage the private market. If I focus in on NRS 278.0105, which defines affordable housing in three different tiers for households with incomes up to 120%, look geographically. What income levels are we building now and where are our biggest gaps? As I mentioned earlier, I can tell you all this information about our subsidized housing because of the inventory tracking and management by the Nevada Housing Division. How do we, the coalition, we, the state, support all the other Nevadans that need different options? I wanna thank my local government partners and the Nevada Housing Division for helping me see that this information is likely already available. And we are perhaps just not compiling it and sharing it like we do our subsidized housing data. So if you refer to section one, um, this section here will capture the existing reporting in a format similar to the Affordable Housing Progress Report. This report will capture the eight components that are already required in the housing element of the master plans. By aligning the two reporting timelines and elevating both reports to the advisory, advisory Committee on Housing, our communities and our leaders, like you, can easily access data to support and inform critical decisions around land use, funding, and programming, for example. It allows me, as a solutions-focused advocate, to make sure I'm supporting two of our critical partners in this work, our local governments and our developers, while continuing to center on Nevadans in need. The Nevada Housing Coalition supports the Housing Modernization Act and is committed to the successful imp implementation and being a helpful resource and partner. We're so grateful to Majority Leader Hadegi, and we look forward to building a more resilient Nevada by building the housing to serve all Nevadans. And thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Josh Hicks, and I'm with McDonald Carano. And I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Home Builders Association, which is the statewide advocacy organization for the home building industry consisting of the Southern Nevada Home Builders Association and the Builders Association of Northern Nevada. Uh, we're here in strong support of Assembly Bill 213. I'd like to thank Majority Leader Howdegee. Uh, I'd like to thank Ms. Hess and the Nevada Housing Coalition uh, and all the stakeholders who we worked with throughout this process to get this bill uh, both drafted and refined into something uh, that you see before you today. I'll give you a brief walkthrough uh, of the sections of the bill. Uh, I will refer in a few places to uh, the amendment that's on Nellis uh, from Majority Leader Howdegee uh, that is dated May 4th uh, and it has a 4.30 p.m. note on it. That's the amendment um, I'll be mentioning. So uh, this bill, I think the, the the best place to start really is near the end in sections 13 and 14, and I'll start there. Uh, these are statements of legislative intent. And I think uh, the reason I like to start there is because it really does a good job of explaining uh, the goal of this bill. And you've heard much of that already um, from, from testimony. But uh, the idea is to find ways to make the land use process um, for residential housing more efficient and more expedient. Um, and it, by doing so, bring a greater supply of homes to market, not just affordable homes, but market rate homes as well. Um, supply and demand are big forces on housing prices. Uh, housing prices are something we struggle with in this state. We're a popular state. A lot of people want to come here. Demand is high. Uh, and bringing supply to market and appropriate supply in different categories is, is extremely uh, important to controlling that pricing. So that's why you see section 13 and 14, those statements of legislative intent that talk about the importance of supply. Uh, the, re the other bill, the rest of the bill, I'll go back now and start at the beginning at section 1.3. Uh, there's really, I, I think of this bill as two parts. There's a, 
a data collection and measurement portion of it, and there's really an action portion of it. Um, and section 1.3 is part of the data measurement. This is a section uh, that would require um, public reporting of um, the processing times, really, for uh, land use applications. Uh, and that's something that um, I think will be helpful for people to understand uh, how long it takes, why it's taking um, long, why it's taking short. It's something we can look at in the future and see where fixes need to be made, if any, uh, to make sure that the process is running as smoothly as possible. This is one section that has um, a technical change on the proposed amendment. Uh, that's in subsection 3. It's line 19 of page 3 of the bill, if you're looking at that. Uh, and it's the word preliminary in line 19 would be we'd recommend that that be stricken uh, just so that the application measurement process uh, tracks all applications, not just preliminary applications. Section 1.6 of the bill, and you heard Ms. Hess speak about this portion of it. Uh, this is a new report that would be uh, required to be submitted to the Housing Division and the Advisory Committee on Housing, and it largely tracks NRS 278.160. And that's the housing element that is included in a, in a master plan. So this information is something that local governments, for the most part, are tracking already. Uh, and we, we intentionally did that in partnership with local governments, asking for them to make that an easier report to compile. Uh, but it, it will provide a lot of inventory and forward-looking thinking about what, we're, what local governments are doing uh, about housing, affordable housing in particular, but market rate housing as well. That is one difference um, between this report and just the housing element in the master plan is that this emphasizes a look forward for market rate housing uh, into the future as well as affordable housing. Uh, then you can see that this is an actual annual report uh, and it's, it's posted by September 15th of each year. S uh, section 2 of the bill is really just conforming changes. Uh, section 3 of the bill is the next substantive section. This is a modification to NRS 278.02327. Um, that is a statute that deals, um, that's been in place for, for many years, and it deals with um, the timeframes in which land use applications are reviewed for completeness. Uh, that's not to say they're reviewed for correctness, it's a review for completeness. This is a section that we've spent a lot of time working on, as you can tell by um, the language. This is something that local governments have made a lot of requests for that we've tried to accommodate to make sure that they have time to adequately review land use applications for correctness uh, and that we don't see applications being stalled out uh, for long periods of time um, just to be reviewed for completeness. We all want from the development community um, review applications to be complete when submitted so that they can be processed and move forward quickly. So. That's what you see um, here. I will say there, the proposed amendment does have some changes to this section, uh, and I'll just mention those briefly. Uh, section 1, subsection 1 of Section 3 uh, includes some clarification language that this does not apply to applications for building permits. It's applications for land use changes. We're really talking about the planning process, not the construction process. Subsection 2, which is line 10 on page 5, uh, this is the section that has a existing rule for a three working day review for completeness of a land use application. We're proposing changing that to 10 working days. That's in consultation with local governments who have asked to make sure that they have adequate time within their resources to conduct a completeness review. Uh, if you look down further, uh, line 19, um, if, a, if a talks about what happens if an application is rejected because it's incomplete. Uh, and this would require the local government to provide a specific description of the problem so that the applicant can get that fixed and resubmit it. If you go on farther down, subsections 3, 4, and 5, and 6 uh, all kind of deal with this whole completeness review. Uh, they require, um, you know, that if the local government misses their completeness review, it's deemed complete, which just means it goes forward down the path. It doesn't mean it's correct. It just means it's deemed complete for going down the path. Um, subsection 4 is another one where we're recommending an amendment in the amendment today. Uh, this requires, this is the re-review of an uh, application that is rejected for being incomplete. Under the first reprint, um, that re-review has to happen within three working days. Under this amendment, we're recommending that be changed to five working days. And that's a shorter period of time than the 10 in the first place because presumably um, the applicant has been given some direction on what needs to be fixed and has done so, so it requires a lesser period of time. Um, 
other than that, subsection 5 talks about uh, allows a preliminary application process. That's something local governments um, have used and have asked for, and so this is a codification of that, uh, and that's designed to make sure applications are complete in the first place and uh, once they're submitted. So it makes, hopefully, the burden easier on the local governments. It also has language in there making sure that, um, or stating that a local government can't use that to circumvent uh, the process because we don't want applications being held up indefinitely. Section 5 of the bill, um, this is this is kind of now we're moving on to the action side of the bill. Uh, this has to deal with um, elements that have to be adopted by any local government that includes a housing element in their master plan. Um, these are action items that they have to choose from a menu um, on the afford to promote affordable housing within their community. And this just has one small change uh, really to the substance of it, which is on page seven, line two, and includes multi-story housing. And the idea there is just to make sure that infill development is thinking about multi-story housing as some, a way to, to address the affordable housing issue. You'll also see some changes in there to dates um, at, at near the end of that section. And that's just to move a lot of the reporting dates to the fiscal year. They were on the calendar year, but that would be easier to deal with for future sessions uh, when, we're, when we're coming back if we need to talk about these kind of things. Uh, finally, section seven, section nine, and section 10 uh, all deal with different types of applications that are provided, either tentative map applications, parcel maps, or final maps. Uh, and the changes here make the current time frames for processing those maps that are applicable to a county applicable to a city within those counties. So it brings the municipalities into the same time frames that the county has to follow. Uh, finally, you heard about section 12 uh, from Ms. Hess, that talks about um, requiring a local government to put forth an expedited process uh, to process affordable housing uh, projects. Uh, that's to get them to the front of the line so that the most, most critical need uh, can be taken care of first. Uh, finally, uh, I think I talked about some of those other sections. Uh, we do have some different effective dates at the very conclusion of this bill in section 16 and the website reporting in particular was moved to January 1st, 2024 to make sure local governments uh, have adequate time to stand up any kind of website reporting that they need to do. So uh, with that, I, that's the concludes the walk through the bill. And again, thank the majority leader for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, and thank you, Chair. Um, before we go to questions, I firmly believe that this bill will bring more homes online. And with an increased supply and in inventory, whether that's affordable housing units, market rate units, uh, apartment units, or homes for people to buy, the more supply we have, the more that helps with affordability of homes. I've spent my my career, about 17 years in housing, both in the public and <coughs> private sector, and I've seen firsthand what delays can do to the cost of housing. Whether it's a project that was supposed to be ready for a move-in within four months um, and it's delayed to 24 months, that cost per door, whether it's an apartment or whether it's a home, goes up significantly. And so speeding up the application to permit process, I believe, will help achieve what we're all looking to achieve this session, which is affordable homes for the people we represent. Thank you. All right, and with that, members, we'll open it up for questions. Senator Daly, please. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and I was just looking in for an edification on on my side on uh, Section 1.6e, where it talks about uh, impediment. So maybe somebody has some <coughs> example, or maybe from the housing uh, home builders' uh, point of view, what are some of the impediments uh, other than Lack of inventory. Thank you, Senator Daly, Assemblywoman Senator Howdy, you for the record. And that might be a better question. I know that we had one of the affordable housing developers testify in support in the, um, in the Assembly. I'm not sure if they're here, but that might be a better question suited for them or one of the local governments. Okay. It, or if someone can follow up with me, it would, would be fine. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Higgs answered my question in Section 3 on if it's not, gonna, uh, if it's not 
complete, it just goes to the next step of the process and corrections can be made. So, And then in uh, Section 5, sub I, where you add the multifamily, um, and I know it's existing language on the incentives, um, but I was just curious, what is transient housing or transit housing? Where we're trying to transition someone from low income into regular, I don't know. Uh, but you can provide some incentives. Now if you're going to provide that to apartments, what type of incentives have been used? Is it monetary? What is? Uh, what are some of the incentives? Because there's other implications when incentives are given. So. Uh, thank you, Senator Daly. Josh Hicks, for the record. Uh, I think for one part, the, the, um, the meaning of transit-oriented in there is really um, to emphasize residential developments that are near um, transit hubs. So like a bus station or something like that, that's, that's really what that's designed to incentivize to minimize impacts on parking and, commu and, and transportation and those kind of things. Um, with respect to the financial incentives, that's, this is something that um, local governments have leeway to do. So different local governments might have different financial incentives and they might be fee waivers or, or things like that. Um, you might see it. I'm sure some local governments could probably give you some good examples of that. That's usually what you see in those kind of examples. If I may, Senator Daly, this is Christine Hess for the record. Um, yes, also commenting um, on your question there around the different types of incentives. Um, it's specific, It's very important with the affordable housing in particular, the access to transit. So many of the tenants in affordable housing need services and they may or may not have access to a car. So by incentivizing the location of affordable properties um, with their access to, tra access to transit, that would be something considered a plus and something we're hoping that our level local governments are doing. And so that menu item there is reported in the affordable housing progress report as an item that they use to incent the type of housing that their communities need. And, and if I may, I apologize. I was slow here in Las Vegas. <laughs> um, but to ask about the analysis of any impediments, I'm happy to, to get you that. Some of the policies that we're talking about this session um, regarding the opportunities like the Housing Modernization Act to um, really track and incent affordable housing are really looking to um, help with some of the impediments that have been identified. But I can definitely provide uh, kind of a list of some of the typical impediments or some that our communities are feeling. Thank you. Thank you. And if you could provide some of the incentives that may have been used, I'd be interested to find out uh, what exactly that we're talking about. Final question, if I can, uh, Mr. Chair, is in Section 15, or you guys are saying that the portion about the unfunded mandate doesn't apply. I was just curious why we're doing that. And I know we put that in there for local governments to, uh, um, and I know it's on the front of the bill that there's a there's a mandate, unfunded mandate or whatever. And I know it uh, only applied if there was going to be more than five thousand dollars. So I'm assuming you're assuming that it's going to be higher than five thousand dollar impact to the local governments. And um, just give me an explanation on why we're doing that. I think I know, but I'd like to hear it. Yeah, thank you, Senator Josh Hicks. Um, I'll do my best to answer that. I think uh, when this bill when this bill began, um, there were some fiscal notes on there. And um, there were local governments that um, that wanted that were needing extra resources to comply with portions of the bill. Um, we've done a lot of the amendments through the first reprint, through the amendment proposed today, that have been designed to mitigate those challenges for the local governments, giving more time for reviewing applications for completeness, giving more time for effective dates on things. So um, I think that was just initially included in there because it was a little unclear exactly what impacts we might have. But I can tell you we've tried very hard through a lot of meetings with local governments to address their concerns and allow them to do this. So um, where do they stand now? Um, you know, hopefully we've addressed a lot of those. Members, additional questions? We're good for now. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you for walking us through that. Um, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 213 to come forward at both in Carson City and Las Vegas. 
And I, I see just one person in Las Vegas. So I'll start with Las Vegas and then we'll come down to Carson City. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. I'm also still Nat Hodson, CEO of the Southern Nevada Home Builder Association. I'm here today in support of AB 213 and thank the majority leader very much for bringing this forward. This bill will provide transparency, predictability, as well as accountability for all that's involved in the application process for projects. So this isn't just for jurisdictions accountability, it's also for the developer, the engineers and everything, because once something's measured and it's out visibly, uh, then you can manage it and you know hopefully improve it. So I urge your support with AB 213. Again, I do thank the majority leader. This has been a, a real big heavy lift for her, I know, but at least uh, she's trying to do something better to bring more supply to the market and uh, more efficient. So thank you. And thank you for joining us. Now we'll come back down to Carson City, please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, Vice Chair Orenshaw, members of the committee for the record, Chelsea Capurro here on behalf of the Nevada subcontractors and the Urban Chamber. And we just want to thank the majority leader for taking on this important issue and being such a leader um, on all issues for, for the construction industry and thank all the, the stakeholders that worked on this and we're in full support and, and urge the committee to support as well. Thank you. And thank you, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores, members of the committee. For the record, Dan Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N, CEO of the Builders Association of Northern Nevada. Here today on behalf of our more than 700 member companies in support of AB 213. AB 213 will provide numerous benefits statewide. <coughs> Excuse me. It will create predictability and accountability in the planning process, and this will ultimately have a positive impact and will help to ease the supply and demand issues, which is a significant issue throughout the state and specifically in northern Nevada. It will improve the ability of our, for our developers and home builders to deliver housing to our state's residents in a much more effective and efficient manner, thus assisting in the effort to increase housing supply throughout the great state of Nevada. We very much appreciate Majority Leader Hadagi's support and advocacy of AB 213 and our ability to deliver housing and request your support of AB 213. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. For the record, my name is Danette Magnus and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of AB 213 brought by Majority Leader Hadagi which will streamline building processes across the state. We need to have better land use planning and planning in this state. Hang on one sec. Hello? Okay. By ensuring deadlines are applied to counties and cities and making the process more transparent, we can ensure Nevadans know how our land is being used and what it is being used for. We are also excited to see the emphasis being put on infill and hope to see more of this work in the future to help us start working toward more affordable housing across the state. Please support AB 213. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us, please. Chair Flores and members of the committee, Kanani Espinoza on behalf of Nevada Hand, the state's largest nonprofit affordable housing developer. Uh, we would like to thank Majority Leader Howdegi for her work on AB 213 and really just being an advocate for housing for all Nevadans. Um, we would also like to show our support and appreciation to the local governments. Uh, both the county and cities have been existing, are, are existing partners with Nevada Hand and we uh, truly appreciate their partnership with their existing affordable housing incentive, incentives. Um, and look forward to continuing those partnerships uh, as the years go on for Southern Nevada. Um, and to Senator Daly's question, we were the developer that uh, did support the bill in the assembly. So we will follow up on your uh, question related to the impediments of affordable housing development, uh, specifically with Christine Hess from the Housing Coalition. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. And, and the incentives. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. My name is Paul Katha, and I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. Uh, the Culinary Union supports Assembly Bill 213, and we thank Assemblywoman uh, Howdegay for bringing it forward. I think is a testament to all her hard work. This is the only time me and Mr. Sandy get to sit next to each other this session. Um, so Nevada has an affordable housing crisis, and the state needs to expedite the production of additional affordable housing as much as possible while maintaining the health and safety of Nevadans. If the state is going to resolve its housing crisis and ensure Nevadans have sufficient water in coming years, housing must be built more densely. Expedite 
expediting and easing the production of affordable housing and higher density housing is sound public policy. Nevada's housing crisis is a responsibility of every level of government, and every level of government has a responsibility to ensure speedy approval of affordable housing production. While the union is supportive of other efforts to ensure that the burden of the housing crisis doesn't fall on the backs of working class Nevadans, we also recognize the need to prepare a path out of this housing crisis and recognize this bill is an important part of that effort. Uh, the Culinary Union urges the committee to support and pass Assembly Bill 213. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Chair Flores, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be before you this afternoon. Uh, for the record, John Sandy here today on behalf of the Nevada uh, Builders Alliance as well as the Nevada State Apartment Association. Uh, I cannot say it any better than Mr. Katha just laid it out for you, so I will say a me too, uh, but do want to recognize the efforts of the majority leader. It is, you know, we joke, but it is, it is very telling when so many stakeholders come together, and, and there have been a lot of work uh, effort put into this, and I think you have a good piece of legislation in front of you, so thank you for your support. Thank you for joining us. Please. Thank you, Chair Flores, members of the committee, Glenn Levitt, Director of Government Affairs for the Nevada Contractors Association. We represent over 450 contractors, subcontractors, industry affiliates, primarily in Southern Nevada. And uh, I like going close to last because I just get to say me too. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and Vice Chair Orrin Chal. For the record, Mindy Elliott representing the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority and the Nevada Rural Housing Authority. As it relates to housing, it's, if it's a bill, I'm, I'm probably here. One of the questions that we always ask is the cost of affordable housing and why, why the expedition uh, is so important. Uh, a, a developer will have a million dollars into a, a project before they even turn the first piece of the first dirt. It just takes, has been taking so long, just from a regulatory as well as the local jurisdictions, not because they don't want to do it, they, a lot of the times, they just haven't had the staff. This bill has really been, um, Assemblywoman Howdegy has done an incredible job of bringing all the partners together as this bill has worked through this house. Uh, I am just so impressed with um, everyone's commitment to building affordable housing and where we need to go. And more importantly, to help our families ease on down the road as it relates to housing, whether it's a starter, family, moving through, buying a house, whatever it might be, the first and foremost thing that we need to do is build inventory. And we want to thank you for your time and consideration of this bill. And certainly, Senator Daly, we will provide um, some of the incentives as well as some of the impediments that the developers are certainly um, having as it relates to this bill. So we thank you for your time today and, and, and of greater importance, we thank everybody who has partnered to, to make this bill a reality. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 213? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? If you would like to testify in support of AB 213, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. My name is Azeem Jatha, and I'm on here on behalf of the Nevada Realtors. First of all, I just want to say that it gives me great hope that um, so many stakeholders from so many different uh, uh, sides of the aisle, for lack of a better term, are all working together on this, and we all agree on this. So we want to thank the majority leader for sponsoring AB 213. Assessing Nevada's housing needs and planning for the future is a critical piece to addressing Nevada's housing market. Uh, Nevada Realtors urge your support on AB 213. Thank you very much for this time, and thank you for just working on this uh, super important bill. And thank you for joining us. BPS, next caller in support of Assembly Bill 213. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Please proceed. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members. My name is Bernalyn Willis, and I'm with the Asian Community Resource Center. We work alongside with the Nevada AAPI Chamber of Commerce. We are here in support of Assembly Bill 213 and thank the majority leader for bringing this bill forward. At the Asian Community Resource Center, housing is a top concern. We think Assembly Bill 213 will provide for faster construction of homes and a greater understanding of what Nevada's housing needs are. 
The more homes we can build, the more stable prices become, which helps our entire community. We also believe in greater transparency be between local governments and the housing industry, which this bill provides. We support Assembly Bill 213, and we thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 213. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of Governor Affairs. My name is Peter Guzman, and I have the privilege of being the president of the Latin Chamber of Commerce. The Latin Chamber is closely connected to Nevada's housing economy because there's a direct link to our business community. Nevada business owners and entrepreneur community need housing, and Assembly Bill 213 will strengthen predictability in timelines for our builders, members, and speed up projects. We're especially excited about the prioritization of processing affordable housing process, uh, projects. We hear it all the time that Nevada needs affordable housing. The way to do that is by unleashing, unleashing and creating the speed in which projects can get done. Another high point of AB 213 is assessing the opportunities for additional housing and articulating the community need as well. An action plan for maintaining and developing affordable housing is crucial to the housing conversation. We want to thank and recognize Majority Leader who brought this in and who met with us and is passionate about AB 213. It's a bold bill that will increase our housing supply to Nevadans. The Latin Chamber urges your support. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 213. Caller 121, you're unmuted. Caller, you're unmuted. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. BPS will stay on the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 213? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition either in Carson City or Las Vegas? Good afternoon, welcome. Whoever wishes to go first. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, members of the Government Affairs Committee, Joanna Jacob on behalf of Clark County. Um, I am here today in opposition, not to the goal or, or intent of this bill. And I acknowledge the work that the majority leader has done. Um, but unfortunately, representing the largest uh, local government um, handling the volume of applications that we do. Um, this bill will have a fiscal impact uh, to us um, and operational impact. I wanna talk a little bit about um, the base, and I apologize, but this is the time at which we can talk about those impacts, Chair Flores, uh, because there will be no other opportunity for us to do that. Um, we, when we receive a land use planning application, the Clark County is under some very strict timelines to get that to hearing before our planning commission or our board of county commissioners. Um, that timeline is very robust. You've seen the work that your staff has to do to get agendas published and amendments in and those types of things. We are constantly moving. I'll give you an example for, to get something on our calendar right now for our September 5th planning commission, that work begins in July. Um, we have a filing period. We've got a period for manager, manager review, um, Filing period, we take all the applications from July 3rd to 12th, the one day for manager review. 
Then we have agenda processing for our staff. We have an administrative deadline by July 31st. We must mail notices to residents and we must do that in order to get that done in by August 2nd. We then must take things to our town board to get resident um, input on any proposed application. That town board goes August 8th to the 10th and then we are then set for public meeting. I wanna talk about the three day timeline that was originally proposed in this bill was put into uh, NRS at a time when we had 100 planners working in Clark County. During COVID, we got down to nine planners. Um, this still takes me aback because the same constraints that the state workforce has, we are experiencing at the county level. Today, we have 18 planners doing that work, but we on average do 1,700 applications through our planning department. So they are doing that work. Um, we have had an application, if anybody's listening to this and has planning experience, we've had a senior planner application open under continuous recruitment for more than 700 days. These are the people who might be able to help us expedite this review. Um, so for that reason, I do appreciate the additional time frames that um, Mr. Hicks testified to and, and also the work that Assemblyman Howergy got us there, but this will, um, this will have a significant operational impact on us, not only to meet the timelines as proposed, it will give us some additional flexibility, but we must have those planners also to be the ones compiling the reporting, which we will have to do. Um, Senator Daly, you had asked about the fiscal impact for us. The, the, Mr. Hicks is right, we did ask for flexibility and they very kindly did give us some flexibility on the implementation of that requirement, which is in January 1st, 2024, but we must make changes to our software in order to accomplish it, this. And we have hit the two minute mark, sorry, okay. but if you could, um, if, if you could provide, is there an amendment or additional no, uh, language? No additional amendments, as I understand. Um, but I would, Chair Flores, just one uh, comment. We are the ones doing the um, fee reduction waivers, the incentives that um, Senator Daly had asked about. So I'd be happy to share that memo. Senator Daly, what we do is we reduce our own enterprise funds that we have 50% um, reduction if you meet certain AMIs with a deed restriction up to 20 years to make sure it's affordable. That has been codified. It's been my understanding that we can use this incentive program um, uh, and it's our sewer fees as well. So we can use that to meet the requirements of section 12. I'm happy to send that in. Chair Flores, so thank you. Thank you for joining us, please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Cadence Matijevic, representing Washoe County, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H. Um, and regrettably, uh, Washoe County t is here as well in opposition. Um, I, I, I will uh, try not to repeat the comments of my uh, counterpart from Clark County. Um, but do want to put on the record that, that Washoe County also um, agrees with um, what's in the legislative intent of this bill. Um, and in no way should our opposition uh, be reflective of, of that, you know, intended uh, to, to not support those, um, those important declarations. We do agree with that. In fact, um, at, a, at a workshop in January, our county commission, as part of the a focus on their strategic plan, has specifically directed our planning team to look for incentives for affordable housing. Um, and, and so we are very um, thankful for all of the work that's gone into amendments on this bill, the concessions that have been made so far, um, and, and we're, we're appreciative of those, but as Ms. Jacobs said, the, there is an impact to our planning staff um, in Washoe County. Uh, we too are looking for planners, so uh, if there's anybody listening who's interested in doing planning work in the north, washoecounty.gov uh, for that opportunity. Um, but, but there is an impact on, our, on both the reporting side and the processing of these applications. Um, and so we felt it was important to get that on the record in this forum, uh, even though we, we have been participating in the process and are very uh, appreciative of the, the work that they've done with us thus far. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Um, is there anybody else wishing to testify in opposition? Seeing none, we will move to the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas. Please. 
Thank you, Chair, Chair Flores, members of the committee, Nicole Rourke, representing the city of Henderson. Um, we'd like to thank the sponsor of the bill and the proponents for working um, with us through um, numerous amendments, um, and we're still tweaking some language with them, but we really appreciate the effort, the um, intent behind the bill. Um, you know, our planning folks are, you know, really working as hard. We are in a 10-day turnaround, so we appreciate them bringing um, forth that um, in order to go to public hearing. Of course, that's in addition to that process, um, but from a processing um, per perspective, we're at a 10-day review period, so um, we're thankful for that amendment, especially especially, um, and appreciate continuous work on this bill. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, please. Nick County, City of Reno for the record. Just want to echo the comments about uh, having vacancies in the planning department. We're no strangers there. Uh, also wanted to point out that the City of Reno has allocated around $5 million to those enterprise fee waivers and does continue to, to process those affordable housing process. Uh, applications as quickly as possible and we want to thank the uh, bill sponsor for their work that they've done throughout this session and thank you for joining us please thank you mr. chair members of the committee for the record Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas um, I too would like to echo my appreciation to the bill sponsor um, for the many 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 meetings that we have had with her both as uh, stakeholder groups but also individually um, to go through some of the intricate details of how our um, organization processes some of these applications. We are very grateful for keeping intact the preliminary application process. The city of Las Vegas has a very thorough um, process in which we gather all uh, departments at one time, so building, fire, planning, um, anything else that might touch that application so that it is a quick and easy process for the applicant. We also, my planning staff tells me there are about 12 incentives on the books that we can offer um, affordable housing applicants. We are uh, using the majority of those incentives to ensure that affordable housing projects are in the city of Las Vegas. Um, as housing is a very, very important um, aspect to what we're trying to do for our constituents. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to speak in the neutral position? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB213, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. Uh, I'm actually sort of support and neutral. I wasn't really sure about what the bill exactly was going to do. I just wanted to hear opposition. Uh, but now that I hear the bill, uh, there's a lot I actually support about it. I do think we should speed up the process of affordable housing. It's a serious, serious crisis. Uh, we're very grateful that this bill has been going forward. And I do think this will address the housing situation a lot better than the other bills. However, I do wish that we could also understand what caused the problem in the first place. About 10, 15 years ago, we were in a financial crisis. Uh, rents were about half the price what we are were now. Uh, we did not make some changes that could have prevented this crisis, such as the low interest rates by the Federal Reserve, hedge funds buying up housing after the foreclosures and not to mention the permitting process, which is pretty tough, which actually this bill actually, not to mention, loosens it up. In addition, that construction isn't keeping up with demand. So we have a lot of builders complaining that lumber, labor, materials is a factor. Lastly, when housing is being built, we don't see a lot of 400-square-foot units, such as casitas and hotel room-sized apartments being built. That is a very important factor. But other than that, thank you so much. Uh, I apologize for going out of line. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in the neutral uh, position, VPS? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Majority Leader, no? And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 213. Thank you. And next, we will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 172. Assemblywoman, welcome.
Thank you, Chair Flores, uh, uh, Vice Chair Orenshaw, and members of the Senate Government Affairs Committee for hearing um, uh, my proposed bill of AB 172 today. My name is Natha Anderson, and it is my honor to represent Assembly District 30, which I consider to be the heart of the Truckee Meadows, and I know that um, Senator Daly feels the same way as he once represented Assembly District 30 as well. I'm here today with Nevada State Education Association Executive Director Brian Lee, as well as uh, Bro Brady Easterling of AFSME to present AB 172, a bill proposing legislation to require local government employers to provide recognized employee organizations uh, the contact information of employees in the bargaining unit uh, that, that that organization ac actually represents. This information would be provided for all members of the bargaining unit, whether they are members of the organization or not. Uh, in addition to just basically the information would be their name, their work location, the work contact information, personal mailing and telephone number. Um, an employee may opt out of this language uh, if they wish to not provide that, and that's actually clarified a little bit in one of the amendments. The timing and dates of providing this information would be expected to be January 1st and July 1st of each year, although if the organizations decide during their bargaining process to have those different timelines, they can. As a local association leader, the organization I had the, the honor to represent, I received that information monthly and um, was able to discuss often with the employer or management the information as whether a member or whether an individual is a member of the organization or not as a public employee, we have to defend them. So to find out if they are a member or not is very helpful. Um, but the reason why I received that, that report monthly was because of the, two, the mutual respect between the two organizations. When I found out that others were not able to receive it, even after the request had been made, it upset me because this is a sign of professionalism. It's a sign of mutual respect between both the union or association, whichever one you might be a member of, and management. It's a way to show that we can work together. This bill is being proposed uh, to both streamline the request as well as clarify this information should not be based on how well the leadership of the two organizations get along. In other words, it should not be based upon personality. It should be based upon the priorities of helping the employees. With Chair Flores' permission, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Lee to explain just a bit more background of the representation required and why this language is needed at this time. Thank you, Assembly Member Brian Lee, for the record, B-R-I-A-N-L-E-E, -E, the Executive Director of the Nevada State Education Association. So here in the state of Nevada, public employee unions are under a legal obligation to represent everyone in their bargaining unit, regardless of their membership status. However, we do not receive the the necessary contact information to make contact with these individuals and to ensure that our bargaining that our bargaining um, our bargaining policies and our representation of these members of the bargaining unit uh, are met in the federal private sector union environment the NLRB has ruled that the private employers have to provide uh, contact information to everyone uh, for everyone in the bargaining unit. This, is, was, as, this was established as early as 1966 in the Excelsior case, it went on in the Prudential Insurance case in the Second Circuit, and then was explicitly stated in the NLRB decision in Harco Industries. So every private employer in the state is required, that has a union, is required to provide this same bargaining information. However, despite our legal obligation, we do not receive this information from all of our employers. Now, there are contracts out there. We do have these contracts as well at the Nevada State Education Association that do require contact information, but there is no obligation under Nevada law um, to require employers to reach a contractual agreement with its employee organizations to provide that information. And if an employer refuses, we are unable to force the information. So this would be a default rule that would provide the necessary information for public employee unions to represent the bargaining unit members, which we are legally obligated to represent. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Assemblymember Anderson. Uh, since the presentation and passage in the assembly, 
conversations have continued around this issue uh, with many different organizations. And so that's actually what the two amendments that you should have in front of you are based upon. The First Amendment comes from Clark County. And it's in particular, it has to do with clarifying in 3B that if an individual um, would like to opt out, they're able to do so. In other words, if they do not wish to have their personal information given to the association, they are able to do so in writing and it would not be provided. The second item um, or as amendment that is being proposed comes from Ask Me, of which we did have some people that were here earlier. Uh, they had to catch a flight. So thank you for understanding that. Um, and with Ask Me, it's, it goes a little bit further because what it's asking is to add in the topic of parking, becoming a par mandatory item of bargaining if needed. So it's in a different section of Chapter 288. Currently, the state employers who currently the state employees, excuse me, who work at UNLV and UNR have to pay for parking. The current practice of negotiations means that the topic can be brought up from one side and the other side can say, that's a great idea, but it's not mandatory. And the topic is over. And that's exactly what's happening because it is permissive language at this time. It is not a mandatory part of bargaining and we were asking that it be done so. When I was talking with some people about it who are actually employees of the university system, the parking ranges from 200, well, $70 if it's a motorcycle, um, but also $250 up to $600 per year, which is a sizable amount when you're taking a look at what we're paying our public employees. And there's no way at this time for these employees to be able to address the issue in negotiations. I believe adding this item in uh, would show we understand the importance of transportation for our employees. Realistically, parking at work is a basic commodity, and employees would not, should not be burdened with this extra expense to do this part of their job. This would allow for the conversation to take place. It is not stating that it has to happen. It is not stating that it has to be on site. It is not stating the parameters of where this parking would be. Instead, it is simply opening the door so the conversation can take place as one of the benefits that our employees could have. Brady Easterling of AFSME might have some other information to add with the chair's permission. Thank you, uh, Brady Easterling, for the record, and just want to acknowledge that we had some folks who wanted to be here. They did have to catch a flight. Um, so being able to afford and maintain a road legal vehicle, especially in Nevada, is already pretty challenging for a lot of folks. Um, and we have a situation where employees are essentially paying their employer for the privilege to drive to work. Um, in reality, employees who spend several years at UNLV and UNR will pay back thousands of dollars to their employer in the form of parking fees. Um, and we do need to address that. Uh, like the assembly member said, we're not putting forward an amendment uh, that guarantees free parking for public employees. This simply makes it a mandatory subject of bargaining so that our bargaining team has the ability to negotiate for it. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, assembly member Anderson. In closing, I would like to first thank uh, Brian Lee, Chris Daly, uh, Joanna Jacobs of Clark County, Brady Easterlin and Carter Bundy of um, Ask Me for all the discussions, the emails, and um, the work on bringing forward this language. More than happy to answer any questions that you might have, and we ask for your consideration of AB uh, 172. And again, we'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present this information. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And we'll acknowledge for the record that there was a, a host of folk here that we're hoping to make their voices heard, but unfortunately they, they couldn't be here, but we are grateful for their presence. And I know a lot of folk um, had an opportunity to, prior to them departing, meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, either in their office or in the hallway. So their presence was, was made. Um, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Senator Daly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question. Um, and it was regarding, so you, you do get the information, the public body uh, gets it to you. And I saw in the Clark County deal, if they maintain that, it seems odd to me. It seems to me that they would have the information on their own employees. Um, but nevertheless, really the question is, so once the labor organization or the 
uh, representing uh, organization gets the information, what are they then allowed to do with it? I mean, do, it's sensitive information. Some people don't want it out. Obviously, there are internal processes and internal purposes for that, but I didn't see anything that, that said you need to then keep it in, you know, confidential, you can't resell it, you can't, you know, those types of things. I didn't know if you considered that or I didn't see anyone bring it up, but... Uh, Assembly Member Anderson, thank you, Mr. Daly, for that question. It has not been brought up. I personally, though, um, what we used that information for was correspondence with everybody to let them know these are the benefits that would be happening. This sort of item, uh, we do not sell that information to anybody, and I would believe that that would be um, something that would also be utilized. However, uh, maybe Executive Director Lee has more information for that. Yes, Brian Lee, uh, Nevada State Education Association, for the record. So uh, we have a fiduciary duty to our members as um, uh, as labor unions. We're both corporations within the state of Nevada that have uh, obligations, but we are under uh, most of labor unions in the state are 501c5s, which are membership organizations or labor organizations. So we have a fiduciary duty to our members and to members of the bargaining unit to protect their information, and we take great cost and protect them to ensure that their information is not resold, that it is protected from cyber attack and a variety of different things. I can speak on behalf of the Nevada State Education Association. And I'm familiar with those uh, rules and, and uh, deals I know we have from our, uh, the laborers when I worked there, um, requirements from our national and the Constitution to protect the confidentiality of that information. Um, and I'm familiar with the Excelsior list and that whole process and the case and why the NLRB uh, gives that information to you. But you're also receiving information on people that are not members for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and I was just, so, so I don't know that your duty extends to the people that are not members. And that's why I asked the question, is, you know, I think it should be limited, you know, to the internal use, legitimate business purposes, et cetera, et cetera. Not that I would think any legitimate organization would do those types of things. Uh, I hope they wouldn't, uh, but I think it should be made, made clear that once they're giving you what would be otherwise personal or confidential information, it shouldn't be um, just free to do whatever you want if that's the context you're receiving it under. Uh, Assemblymember Anderson, thank you, Mr. Daly, for bringing that forward, and I would be very open to amending in that language to make sure that it's very clear. It is not for those purposes. Thank you for bringing up that oversight that, that was not clarified in there. And members, any additional questions? Sounds good. Uh, Assemblywoman, please. If I could, please, also, um, Assemblymember Anderson, I want to make sure that it's very clear that the parking is for the statewide organizations. Um, we're not looking for it for for not the local government collective bargaining, although I do think that's a smart thing to also for that to be able to become part of. At this time, however, we're, we're really concentrating mostly on the state organizations as they are at this time the, the organizations that are mostly affected and impacted by the... Um, the parking issue based upon how incredibly expensive it is to park at our universities. Although, I'm not going to lie, more than likely one or two floors of the parking lot were paid by my parking tickets from a number of years ago. So, so yes. And thank, thank you, you, Assemblywoman, for, for that clarification. Um, uh, with that, I'd like to invite the three of you to sit back. And we will invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 172 to please come forward. <laughs> Please, welcome. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We are here today in strong support of Assembly Bill 172, and thank Assemblywoman Anderson and the rest of the sponsors for bringing this important legislation forward. Labor unions should have access to workers in the bargaining units they represent, because when this information is readily available, the unions can focus on their efforts on outreach and representation of those workers as soon as possible so they can represent the contracts the best way possible. 
We also agree with the amendment language. Having gone to UNLV, I know how expensive parking at the universities can be. You should not need to pay for parking to do your job, and this should absolutely be a part of their bargaining. We urge your support of AB 172. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Hello, Chairman Foreman, <coughs> uh, Flores, uh, members of the committee. My name is Kaylin Evans, and I'm the president of the Washoe Education Association. Uh, we represent the certified professionals in the Washoe County School District. We want to thank Assemblywoman Anderson for bringing this bill forth and her, her continued strong advocacy for unions and workers across the state. Uh, the role that unions play in advocating, supporting, and representing the workers in this state cannot be understated. We are obligated to provide fair representation for all workers who fall within our bargaining unit and it is the duty and it is a duty that we take very seriously uh, to provide fair representation to every member of the bargaining unit unions need to know who is represented and how to communicate with these employees when employers are unwilling to provide basic contact information for employees represented by the union there is no way to carry out the responsibilities of fair representation Unions are the cornerstone of the working class, and legislation that helps support union employer collaboration is crucial. The added amendment regarding mandatory subjects of bargaining further strengthens worker rights, and we are appreciative of that added language in this bill. AB 172 helps to address an important issue, so we encourage support of this legislation. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. My name is Paul Katha, and I represent the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. The Culinary Union supports Assembly Bill 172 and would like to thank Assemblywoman Anderson for bringing the bill forward. The Culinary Union strongly believes in all workers' right to collective bargaining and that the state should uh, ensure that public sector labor unions have the information necessary to fulfill their duties as required by the law. As someone intimately familiar with the Excelsior lists of worker information uh, referred to by Mr. Lee, I can confirm his comments about private sector unions are correct. The Culinary Union urges the Nevada Legislature to support and pass Assembly Bill 172. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris Daly, Nevada State Education Association, uh, in support of AB 172, uh, so public sector unions can fulfill their duty of fair representation to every employee uh, in the bargaining unit. I won't repeat uh, what others who've come before me have said, but I uh, do want to uh, thank uh, Joanna Jacob of Clark County uh, for working uh, together with us uh, on, an, on an amendment. Uh, there was some opposition uh, to this bill uh, over on uh, the assembly side, I think. In particular, we heard uh, concerns around uh, members of the bargaining unit, unit being able to opt out, uh, as well as uh, you know, making sure that uh, this information uh, just you know, doesn't become public information uh, unintentionally through this bill. Uh, and I, th I think we've uh, crafted some language uh, where uh, you know, we can get to a point where uh, you know, there's some, some agreement in terms of finding a common ground. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, next speaker in support of Assembly Bill 172. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? Well, the client is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. We will now go to those wishing to testify in opposition. BPS will start on the phone. Opposition to Assembly Bill 172. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Now we'll come back to Carson City, please. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Dylan Keith, D-Y-L-A-N-K-E-I-T-H with the Vegas Chamber. We do appreciate the sponsor making this a opt-out process. Uh, however, the Chamber still does have concerns with the privacy and security of these public employees' information, including their home addresses, personal cell phone, and personal email addresses. We do believe that a opt-out or opt-in would be more necessary as is current. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 172? Seeing none, we will now go to those wishing to testify in the neutral position, Carson City or Las Vegas. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Alejandro Rodriguez, Director of Government Relations for Nevada System of Higher Education. We'd like to thank the bill sponsor for alerting us about the proposed amendment this afternoon. While our team is still reviewing the proposed language, we look forward to working with her as the process moves forward. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Please. 
And Chair Flores, members of the committee, Joanna Jacob, on behalf of Clark County, um, I would like to thank Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Anderson, Mr. Daly, and Mr. Lee from NSEA. Um, I, I worked with them on this amendment because Clark County has a large number of bargaining units, and we collectively bargain for this information and this exchange of data. We wanted to make sure, since it was a larger change to statute overall, that it would work for us as well. Um, and uh, Senator Daly, to respond to your question about if information is maintained, if there's a better way to do it, um, I'll take a, <laughs> I take a suggestion, but that was intended to address, we have a large number of employees who are out in the field, so they don't have a dedicated work location, and because it was a shall report, it's just, if we have it, we'll report everything we do. I will note that um, we do have a Clark County ordinance that protects employee confidentiality, so we disclose job title, salary, job department assignment and duties, but we do hold other information uh, private. So we were trying to strike the balance with this amendment on how we could continue to do that, but also ensure that Assemblywoman Anderson and Mr. Daly got the intent of what they were trying to do. So I think we got there. I would like to thank them for their work. Um, and I think that's the only other, the only other clarification um, that wasn't discussed is there's a change to um, bargaining units of 100 or less or fewer. We do have some small, small, small units in Clark County, including those um, who work on the trams at our airport, that there's 10 people in that unit. So if they wanted to bargain for to exchanging the data that they would be able to do so that would be administratively um, supportive. And I think that was, um, I'd like to thank Mr. Daly um, for his work on this because I, we, this has been a good experience of us get meeting in the middle and, um, and we are neutral with the amendment. Thank you very much. And thank you, please. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, Jennifer Berthium, that's B-E-R-T-H-I-A-U-M-E, -E, Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties. We would like to thank Assemblymember Anderson for her work uh, with all the stakeholders on this bill and with the amendment from Clark County, uh, NACO is neutral on AB 172. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair <clears throat> and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Wood, for the record, representing the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities. Um, like the others that came before me, I want to uh, thank the sponsor for working with stakeholders on the amendment that you have before you, uh, which addresses uh, many of the concerns that we had about the privacy and confidentiality of uh, personal information of our local government employees. So I want to thank her and the stakeholders for that work, and uh, that brings us to neutral on the bill. And thank you for joining us, please. Mindy Elliott represents with Flynn Judy C. Government Affairs representing the city of Fernley today. And um, I won't uh, repeat everything that's already been said, but with the amendment, we are neutral. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, David Cherry, <clears throat> Government Affairs Manager for the City of Henderson, D-A-V-I-D-C-H-E-R-R-Y for the record. Uh, I join our local government colleagues in expressing our thanks and want to just say me too to everything that's been said. And thank you for joining us. Seeing no one else in Carson City or Las Vegas, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? Neutral for Assembly Bill 172. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And with that, Assemblywoman, any closing remarks? The Assemblywoman is satisfied that the bill is in a good place. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 172, and we'll move to our last bill presentation. Uh, Assemblywoman Considine, welcome, and we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 219. Thank you, Chair Flores, um, Vice Chair Orenshaw, and members of the committee. I am Venetia Considine, and I represent Assembly District 18, and I'm here to present Assembly Bill 219. Uh, a, uh, AB 219 is a response to a bill from the 81st session. 
In the 81st session, I carried a bill, AB 253, that concerned the open meeting law. The intent of that bill was to keep the benefits of the re remote technology in place that we had learned through the COVID uh, period because it was beneficial to many people who felt they had accessed their government for the first time and felt some um, ownership. We wanted to ensure that those um, items that allowed people to take part in their government would remain available. I wanted to point out that that bill passed unanimously in both houses. However, throughout the interim, I was contacted by folks from around the state who brought up issues with the open meeting law and AB 253. This bill, AB 219, is response to those issues that were discussed with me. I do want to be clear, though. The law before AB 253 already allowed remote technology meetings, and neither AB 253 or this bill, AB 219, change that. These were issues that were brought to me separately. In the assembly version of this bill, um, it was it had more things in it, met with a lot of a lot of stakeholders in this, um, did a lot of amending with this bill and came up with a bill that I believe balances everything, uh, the, at least the goals of it, and also um, removed most, if not all, of the opposition. So I will go over the bill. So section one, this section covers public comment. So subsection one of section one provides that comment may occur at the beginning of the meeting and again at adjournment or after each item on the agenda on which action may be taken. Subsection two allows for general public comment on any matter. Subsection three allows a public body to take additional public comment beyond what is listed in subsections one and section two. Subsection four covers what happens when a meeting is continued beyond one or more calendar days. This was something that was brought to me by several, by several people, that if a meeting was continued and there were days in between that meeting, that there were no public comment periods available. This um, adds a public comment requirement being required at the beginning of each day and again before the meeting recesses or after each item on the agenda before the public body takes action on the item in situations where it's a multi-day meeting and there are days in between the days that the meeting is continued. Subsection, or section two, subsection 3D8, I'm on page five. If a, if a meeting uses remote technology and it does not have a physical location where members of the general public can attend and participate in, this bill requires that a clear and complete instructions are to be given for a member of the public, public to call in. One of the issues that was brought to me multiple times as well is that um, people did, it was unclear, they didn't know um, how to find that information, and this requires that that information include the telephone number, the identification number, and other access code um, for a meeting that is completely remote. Um, subsection 24A, bottom of page 5, requires the posting of a notice of the meeting in a public body, uh, meeting of the public body at a physical location where the meeting will be held. There, in AB 253, it um, allowed for um, a significant lack of public posting on these, and these were specific, uh, this was a specific request uh, I received to have it at least posted in the location where a public meeting will be held. Section three, subsection three, four, um, three, sections four and five, bottom of page nine and 10, requires that a meeting to consider a contested case or regulation requires a physical location for the meeting where members of the public are permitted to attend and participate. This came out of um, initially requests to require some sort of meetings if that members attend certain meetings or having a place for it for people to um, to be physically involved in the original iteration of this bill it did require meetings with um, some of the members of the public body in person that was heavily objected to so this is the result of that is to have um, a physical location for the meeting where members of the public are permitted to attend and participate and further include the clear and complete instructions that must be given for a member of the public to call in, provide comment on that information, again, must include a phone, telephone number and identification number or other access code, and it must be read verbally. 
Uh, and then again, just if that wasn't clear on this section that I just read, this would be required when there is a contested case or regulations that are being um, determined by a public body. So those are all the sections of the bill, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and thank you, Assemblywoman. I know that you worked very diligently before on that, and I appreciate you continuing that work into the interim. Um, that's very much appreciated. Members, any questions? Senator Daly, please. Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Daly. More a comment, too. I appreciate the bill, and I appreciate your past work. I think that it was uh, monumental in terms of us being able to keep public meetings going, you know, through times of crisis and be able to allow the public to participate with the benefit of the technology. So I just want to thank you for this bill and, and your prior legislation. Senator Daly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and I appreciate the bill as well, but wanted to just so I understand and because uh, I've seen public bodies do a variety of different things, right? Sometimes they'll have public comment at the beginning for things that are not on the agenda mm -hmm. and then the same thing at the end. Um, and then for each item, if it's going to be action, you could speak on those uh, as they come up. And I think that's kind of the better way. But nevertheless, trying to read this, except as otherwise provided in this section under sub one. So at the beginning of the meeting, before any items on which action may be taken or heard, the public body, uh, and again, after adjournment of the meeting, or, right? So is that meant to be that you can take public comment at the beginning and again at the end on items that are on the agenda? or you can take them on each individual item when they come up. And then sub two would say at the end, regardless at the end, you would have public comment on issues that are not on the agenda. So I just want to make sure I'm not confusing the two and I've seen, seen different public bodies do it different ways. But uh, anyway, I'm trying to figure out if you're having two <coughs> public comment periods on the agenda or one while it's actually coming up. Thank you through uh, Senator Flores to Senator Daly, Venetia Consign for the record. Um, yes, and if I read this too many times, I get confused. <laughs> um, but the answer succinctly is, is all three. To, one of the things I've learned in um, two sessions carrying open meeting law bills is I don't know if there is a one size fits all for, um, for any of the bodies across the state considering they're so diverse in, in sizes, locations, ev and everything. So the, um, the compromise that we reached was they, if they choose to have a meeting, um, sorry, a public comment at the beginning, they need to have it at the end. Or if they choose, they can have an, um, each, uh, after each item, which would be the first part, the or. So they can do it one way or the other. They could do it both ways if they wanted to, but we wanted to give as much flexibility as possible. Um, and then the second is um, public body must allow general public to comment on any matter that is not specifically included in the agenda as an action item at some time before adjournment of the meeting. That means it could go through, the way that I read it, through um, A or B on page one. They can do it either way. Um, no action may be taken upon a matter raised during a period, it, a period devoted to comments by the general public, et cetera, unless it has been on, um, on an agenda. Does that answer your question? I think so, and I, and I understand the or in there, and or versus and, and uh, statutory construction. But I guess it's the question is, so what is the subject of the public comment? Um, generally, right, you have public comment like we have at the end for issues that are not on the agenda. We're not having hearings again and all that kind of stuff. Um, so a lot of times you'll have public comment at the beginning and at the end, but only on subjects that are not on the agenda. And, and I'm just trying to make sure that in the ones, the uh, comment that periods that we're talking about in subsection one, you would have one at the beginning, one at the end on things that are on the agenda, or you could have them not have public comment on that at the beginning and the end and only have it per item. And then you have to have at least one public comment on non-agendized items uh, at the end. I, and I was just, I'm not trying to, it's very confusing, I, I understand, but I've seen public bodies do it all different ways. So to me, it's almost, what is the subject of the public comment? Uh, we need to just make sure we have that clear. And I have 
Thank you to Senator Daly through Chair Flores, Venetia Consign for the record. Um, the, the idea in conversations with this is to in, ensure that we had options for public comments on items that were on the agenda and in front of, um, of the body, but also to allow or require a time for um, folks to talk about things that are not on the agenda. So, and, and maybe I'm sort of missing what you're talking about, but this was to cover it both, both ways. One way what everything is on the agenda and when can people can comment it, but also during, um, at the time that the meeting takes place, there must be a time for folks to give public comment on items that are not on the agenda. And fine, final question, it's not, not in the bill, but it's maybe something for, uh, for future thought. Uh, I do also see a lot of times, and I don't know if it's in a regulation somewhere, I haven't reviewed the whole open meeting law in a long time, where they put a time limit. They give you a three minutes or some other time uh, that you can speak under public comment, otherwise uh, you'll be there indefinitely on, on one speaker sometimes. Um, but I have also seen, and we might want to think about this in the, in the future, where not that we want to stifle public comment or anything, but people start to use it as a, as a tool, and they have three hours of public comment. Ninety people come and each talk for their three minutes and say the same thing repeatedly at every meeting. School district, city council, county commission, um, and I didn't, there's no time limits anywhere. I mean, I think at some point we might have to address that. But. That's another story for another time. Senator Daly is stirring everything up right now. Uh, um, uh, we also have uh, our legal who jump in on the conversation, please. Uh, for the record, this is Heidi Clarkson with the Legislative Council Bureau. Um, if a public body is going to provide a limitation, such as like a time limitation um, on public comment, that does have to be on the agenda um, itself. Um, and as far as uh, the subject matter, uh, obviously there's First Amendment implications in, in limiting um, what people talk about. However, even under the First Amendment, public bodies um, pursuant to the open meeting law are allowed to limit public comment um, if somehow the public comment is not relevant to the jurisdiction of the public body um, and also if it is willfully disruptive. Um, there, there are some, um, some ways that the even under current law, the public body may limit public comment. And thank you for that. Next, we'll go to Senator Guaycachia, please. Thank you, Madam Ch uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, a lot of my questions have been answered in the last couple of conversations, but I was very concerned about, you know, trying to have public comment on every agenda item on, a, on an agenda because some of them might be uh, maybe a bid award would be something they might, someone might want to comment on, but with the OR, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, having sat on a county commission for 16 years, I know about public comment, and I know some of them can go long. And, uh, but typically, in local government, you don't see a real movement to limit any, the public's comment, and, of course, I've never seen anywhere where you were actually said, you, you can't talk about this agenda item or what, what the action we've taken there. Uh, just typically local governments don't do that. So, yeah, I, I was nervous when I first read the bill because I missed the OR in the first, and I was thinking, boy, this will, you're going to be in for all week to have one, a one-day meeting. But, uh, yeah, typically I, I think it's uh, and pub we have having public comment in the start and the end is all you really are required to do under this bill. Thank you. And, and he's in agreement with you, Assemblywoman. He, he loves your bill. Uh, we have legal uh, coming in as well. Please. Thank you again um, for recognizing recognizing me, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to point out um, for the record and, and to hopefully avoid any uh, confusion, the Section 1 of the bill um, in, in, in part is a bit of a reorganization of the current uh, requirements under the open meeting law for uh, public comment. Um, there is new language in section, it looks, it, it's new language, um, subsections one, two, and three. That actually comes from, um, if you can see on page four 
of the bill, uh, starting on line 36, there is some language that is bracketed. Um, going on to the next page five, um, line 10, in drafting uh, the additional uh, piece that the Assemblywoman is requesting relating to <coughs> continuation of meetings and what public comment um, is required when a meeting of a public body is continued. Uh, we did have to do a bit of reorganization. We didn't feel that the new language in sub four of section one that is starting on page three uh, could really be worked in very easily as far as where the existing provisions of the public comment requirements are. And so um, I apologize for the confusion it may have caused as far as it appearing like there are changes to the public comment periods. Um, the requirement that a public body take public comment at the beginning um, and at the end or after each uh, item is current law also regardless um, the, the language on page three starts regardless that is also in current law so some of the language appears new uh, because it's being reorganized it's not necessarily a new requirement of the open meeting law what is new in section one is the language in subsection four Senator Krasner please thank you chair Thank you, Assemblywoman Considine, for bringing this bill. I can't tell you how many constituents tell me we elected these people and they don't listen to us, or I spent you know four hours of my day to get down to that public meeting so that I could you know make my concerns uh, out to the elected officials, and then they limited me or they told me public comments not at the beginning it's only at the end and I have to sit there for four hours through a whole meeting and I don't have time to do that I work I have children and I think this is wonderful and then calling in clear instructions to call in I've heard that too you know I don't know how to call in I tried I looked I didn't see instructions I didn't see a, a code and and this is wonderful I think that the public will really appreciate your bill so, so thank you for bringing it and thank you again for the presentation. At this time, I'd like to invite you to sit back. Uh, unless I missed any additional question from a member, no. And I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support. Welcome. <coughs> yeah, at some point today, you two are going to agree. Just had it. We just had to wait for the fourth bill. Whoever wishes to go first. <laughs> For the record, my name is Annette Magnus, and I'm the Executive Director of Battleborn Progress. We strongly support AB 219 and thank Assemblywoman Considine for bringing this bill forward, giving Nevadans multiple options to provide public comment, especially uh, if a meeting takes more than a day, will make our governing bodies more transparent and accessible to the public, especially in local governments where the decisions being made deeply affect people's lives. We need to make sure the public has every opportunity to participate and make it easier, not harder. We have actually see this, seen this play out the wrong way firsthand at the Clark County School District Board of Trustees meeting, and we know this is critical. So please support AB 219. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us, please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, Dylan Keith, D-Y-L-A-N-K-E-I-T-H with the Vegas Chamber. We would like to thank Assemblywoman Considine for her work on this legislation. This bill improves constituent and stakeholder access to prevent commissions and boards from meeting without providing instructions on how to provide public comment, which, as you all know, is necessary in creating functional policy. Thank you again to the bill sponsor for ensuring all Nevadans have a voice in government, and thank you, members, for your time. And thank you for joining us. Please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee members. Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T, E-R-V-I-N, for the Nevada Faculty Alliance, the independent as statewide association of professional employees of the Nevada System of Higher Education, in support. AB 219 cleans up some items related to the move towards virtual and hybrid meetings, but we particularly appreciate the clarification about public comment on each day of a multi-day meeting. A certain board, where we at NFA regularly advocate for faculty issues, holds multi-day meetings on a single agenda. At one of those, the Deputy Attorney General for the board advised the chair to add a public comment at the end of the first day, even though it wasn't on the official agenda in the full spirit of the open meeting law. But it was at the end of the long day, so we didn't take advantage. 
On the morning of the next day of the meeting, we were expecting a similar public comment period at the beginning of that meeting of that day, but a different Deputy Attorney General President that day indicated that it was not necessary to have an additional public comment periods for multi-day meetings, even if the, if the meeting were agendized on non-contiguous days over weeks or months. So AB 219 will provide clarity and allow public input on each day of a multi-day meeting. Thank you to Assemblywoman Considine for bringing the bill and her work on it. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to testify in support? Seeing none, we will go to those wishing to testify in opposition, Carson City or Las Vegas. Excuse me, uh, before I do that, is there anybody wishing to testify in support over the phone? If you would like to testify in support of AB 219, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. I support this bill. I will ditto the comments. P public participation is very important. We'd like to thank the Assemblywoman for bringing this very important bill. Yield. Thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 219? Good evening, um, Chairman and Committee my name is Lynn Chapman, and I'm State Vice President of Nevada Families for Freedom. We all hear about transparency in government. That is one of the key parts of any free society, and the U.S. law encourages government agencies to make their records and meetings available to the public. Public notice of meetings, as well as meetings held openly, are encouraged. Nevada's open meeting laws were enacted way back in 1960. AB 219 encourages public participation in our local government by voicing their opinions, their grievances, and personal stories that may be helpful in making decisions for our towns, cities, county, and state. We need to discourage chairmen or government bodies of various agencies from denying public participation or making it so difficult for the public to participate, which has happened in the past. Giving the public the opportunity to speak before a meeting begins, before a vote on an agenda item, and after a meeting at the end of each day, even if the meeting goes for more than one day, is a huge improvement over our open meeting laws for Nevada. Also, having the ability to interact with government agencies online makes it easier for everyone to be able to participate if they so wish. We should always keep in mind that the governmental agencies are there for the public to run our towns, cities, counties, and state. Working together is best for our society, and good open meeting laws are essential. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, next caller in support of Assembly Bill 219. Hello, my name is Michael Ryan, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-R-Y-A-N, and I'm a longtime resident of Nevada. AB 219 improves the open meeting law. It provides for more defined opportunities for the public to participate in local government, school boards, and other meetings. Please vote yes on the AB 219. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 219. Hello, um, good evening, uh, Chair and the rest of the wonderful hardworking committee. This is Dora Martinez representing the Disability, uh, Nevada Disability Action Coalition. We are in wholeheartedly 100% um, support this bill. Some of you that knows me knows that I don't drive, and this is one of the good things that we do as a uh, disabled constituent that we can call in and, and I'm so grateful for the sponsor of the bill that provides a phone number because not everybody knows how to use the Zoom where um, you know you have to have an internet connection and all that stuff. So thank you so much uh, for everything that you all do and take care. And thank you for joining us. 
Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 219. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Now we'll move to those wishing to testify in opposition. BPS, do we have anybody wishing to speak in opposition to Assembly Bill 219? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Anybody in opposition, Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none. BPS, do we have anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 219? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And Assemblywoman, well, is there any closing remarks you wanted to make? No? We're good to go? All right. Well, with that, I, I appreciate uh, those of you who came and testified in support. And thank you again for all your hard work, Assemblywoman. We appreciate that. We'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 219. And uh, next we will open up for public comment. BPS, we have anybody wishing to join us for public comment? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And I think I may have, did I skip neutral? Accidentally? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't accidentally skip that. Never mind, we're good to go. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, and uh, members, just to give you a heads up, we'll be meeting on Wednesday, but it is the intent of the committee not to meet on Friday so that you may plan accordingly for Mother's Day and take care of, of your lovely mothers and your family. Um, with that, this meeting is adjourned.